Welcome, and thank you all for attending our pre-recorded presentation for ICLBC 7, titled Resources for Reclamation, Creating a Relational Dictionary Knowledge Base. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we, the presenters, live and gather is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Stolo, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We'd all like to in introduce ourselves. My name is Victoria Sear. I am a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver campus. I am non-Indigenous and my ancestors were immigrants from the United Kingdom. I am the coordinator on this project. In addition to this project, I collaborate with Yukon First Nations and the Yukon Native Language Center to support language programming in their communities and the Yukon generally. Hi, uh, my name is Benjamin Chung. I'm a non-Indigenous linguist of Korean and Jewish heritage. My interests include minority language re vernacularization digitization, and archival mobilization. Uh, my role in the relational uh, lexicography project is as an undergraduate research assistant. And uh, I currently work with the First Peoples Cultural Council in their lingua technology programs. Hi, I'm Meryl Amos Delaritelli. I'm an undergraduate student in the First Nations and Endangered Languages program at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. I'm a student of mixed European settler descent with connections to Eshquiat First Nations Remerick. Uh, I'm an undergraduate researcher on this project, and I also work as the audio technician for the Heshquiat First Voices Archive. Now we'd like to introduce our project. For the last year and a half, we and other project collaborators have been working to create a knowledge base of print and online dictionaries of indigenous and historically marginalized languages spoken in North America. This knowledge base is part of a wider project funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada that is titled Relational Lexicography, New Approaches to Community-Informed Dictionary Work. The goal of the Relational Lexicography Project is to create publicly accessible resources and frameworks that people can use to inform their own dictionary projects of Indigenous and historically marginalized languages, while acknowledging the inherent relationality entailed in undertaking a community dictionary project. As people who have collaborated in a variety of dictionary projects, one way we have approached this project is to look at other dictionaries for inspiration and guidance. This is what we call our scoping, looking for as many examples of as many dictionaries of Indigenous languages as possible to include in our knowledge base. In the remainder of our presentation, we will talk about how we are working to create this knowledge base and some of the decisions we've had to make along the way. Once it is live, we hope this knowledge base will be one small yet meaningful step in building networks of Indigenous and non-Indigenous collaborators who are working in support of language revitalization and reclamation. What is relational lexicography? Before we start talking about the nuts and bolts of our knowledge base, we wanted to take a minute to situate our presentation and project within the wider conference theme of recognizing relationships. We use the term relational lexicography because we want to acknowledge the relationality involved in developing a dictionary of, for, and in an indigenous language. There is no one size fits all when it comes to creating dictionaries that respond to community needs and support community goals for language reclamation. We also want to acknowledge a process of dictionary making that represents a shift towards dictionaries that are created by speakers and with learners of under-resourced languages. For these reasons, trusting and long-term relationships are foundational elements of a relational lexicography or dictionary making. In our project, we also understand that relationships can also refer to the relationship that people have to and with dictionaries and the knowledge they include and the histories and legacies they carry with them.
In this visual, we include several broad features that might be typical of what comes to mind when someone thinks of a language dictionary. And we welcome those of you watching to take a moment to reflect on how you might uh, identify and categorize something as a dictionary. Uh, in our experience, there are some features that stand out to us as salient in describing relational lexicography, in particular, ones that relate to format and accessibility, as well as uh, the interest and investment from the community in the dictionary's creation, distribution, and usage. For example, is the dictionary downloadable in an app format or distributed by a school program? Does the dictionary go by its title or does it have a nickname in the community? Are the images within it from the community? Are there elder remarks in the footnotes? Are stories included? If so, whose are they? Dictionaries vary in how they are undertaken, developed, and organized and shared. So it's not helpful to suggest that one dictionary is more relationally minded than another. Uh, as another example, later in this presentation, I will discuss how the attribution of a publisher did not generally appear as a centralized prioritized category in our dictionary scoping, because many community created dictionaries have not been formally published. These features, however, are still part of the history and construction of the dictionary, of any dictionary. To give another visual, in relational lexicography, we can see that some of these existing features become more central or are amalgamated into more holistic categories. The features clustered within the dark red brackets inform these questions and are integral themes in how we view a dictionary and the context in which it was developed. These features also highlight choices people might want to consider when developing their own dictionary. For these reasons, throughout this project, we have spent considerable amounts of time thinking about how to record certain features of the dictionaries we scope and how we pre will present these features in our knowledge base. To develop a dictionary knowledge base, we of course need access to dictionaries. To begin this undertaking, we started looking at language families that fall within what's currently Anglo and Francophone North America and tried to identify as many names for a language as possible to allow us to cast a broad net for initial searches. We entered each dictionary we were able to find into a spreadsheet with each language family being its own tab. Early on, a decision was made to have a soft cutoff of around 1950 when searching for these dictionaries. It's unlikely that the resources made before then were created in a collaborative way, but exceptions were made in the case of reprints, or if there were few or no resources created after that. We will scope earlier dictionaries at a later date. The first searches involved looking at Wikipedia programs for each language. The references often contain dictionaries, links to language programs, articles in newspapers, and the like. Next, we started looking on Glottolog and WorldCat to find published text. Once that was done, it was on to a general Google search to find websites, PDFs, community published works, and really anything else we might have missed. There were a couple strange finds, such as a Lakota dictionary app published by a group called My Taxi Ride Incorporated, and a pronunciation guide where most of the example audio clips were spoken by someone located in the Czech Republic, which we later found out was someone affiliated with the Lakota Language Consortium. Suspicious resources were thankfully few and far between. Two seconds. As a side note, the start of this close scoping aligned with the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, which created difficulties. There were many precautions being taken, which severely limited our access to written materials. Libraries were closed, interlibrary loans were unavailable, and people weren't exactly jumping at the chance to loan us books from their personal collections. We are grateful to Sarah DuPont, the head of UBC's Indigenous Library, for allowing us access to the collections over the spring while following strict protocols. We were able to look at many print resources over the course of a couple of weekends, but it became very apparent just how scattered dictionary resources are, as well as how great a need there is for language resources, such as dictionaries, during a global pandemic. As we reviewed more dictionaries, we started encountering the same questions over and over, such as, what makes a dictionary different from an extensive word list? Who is the author and who assisted? And how and when should we categorize, and how and when should we use this categorization criterion? For example, when a dictionary includes multiple pages highlighting contributions of elders, 
and they're not named as the authors, how do you appropriately acknowledge and categorize their contributions? As we review dictionaries, we enter them into a Google Sheet, a massive Google Sheet. Uh, through various team discussions, we talked through what criteria or features you wanted to include in the spreadsheet. And at the end of the day, it came down to what we thought would be most useful for people uh, who are actively looking for these resources. What information will connect people to the dictionaries uh, they're looking for? Uh, these are several criteria or features that we, uh, that we noted. Uh, instead of using the label author, we chose to use who and others involved and specified how they are identified in the project and dictionary creation. Uh, the format of uh, a dictionary, how and where citations appeared, if speakers or contributors were marked just in select entries or uh, by entry, uh, dialects and orthographies, uh, if they were present, in, like syllabics. Our goal in noting these features was not to provide by a full snapshot of each dictionary, but to give enough details to people in uh, their search. For example, if someone is curious how contributors have been credited in different dictionaries or how entries uh, have been arranged via dialect and multi-dialectal dictionaries. Some major questions we encountered while reviewing the 750 dictionaries were regarding accessibility and publisher primarily. Under accessibility, we found that some dictionaries did not have we did not have access to and found that there are reasons for that. For example, being community access only. Uh, we respected the privacy of these resources. We are facilitators point people to knowledge and noted this information accordingly. Another aspect of accessibility is in how some dictionaries were only accessible in some special collections or in print. An example of that is we knew they exist, but we can't access them ourselves. Under publisher, uh, this criteria is brought up to us midway through scoping and kind of gave us pause. When thinking about a user-centered dictionary database for people starting out, searching for indigenous language dictionaries, publishers or publishing houses did not really stand out as criteria that were singular or central. Part of the reason for this is that many community dictionaries, a publisher category would have been unrepresentative because although these dictionaries were developed by or in alliance with a community or language program, they weren't technically published. In the other direction, some dictionaries, particularly in the realm of language apps, are very heavy on branding and acknowledging the publishing body. We found that in categorizing who counts as publisher highlights just one of the layers of relationality that can exist and have dictionaries are developed and shared. So once we had a sizable amount of dictionaries scoped, we had new questions to address. Namely, what is the best system for, for taking all the information contained in our spreadsheet and making it an online searchable knowledge base? How can we make sure this knowledge base is user-friendly and easy to navigate? And how can we ensure this knowledge base remains online for years to come and how can we ensure continued accessibility for everybody? We took advantage of the resources available to us at UBC and are working with staff at the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology to address these questions. Through extensive discussions with them, they advise us the best way forward is a two-step process that our team could undertake with their support and guidance. Our first step is to create a way to organize entries for each dictionary. Our support team at UBC recommended we do this by creating a relational lexicography wiki. You can see the image of our wiki landing page here. One of the reasons we chose to enter our dictionaries in wiki is that it's open access. So in the future, this knowledge will remain accessible. Ben, Merrill, and the new team member, Serena Bouvier, are currently working to make an individual wiki entry for each dictionary. Here you can see screenshots of part of an entry for a dictionary we chose at random. As you can see, every criteria or feature that we listed in the original scoping spreadsheet is now a wiki category, such as language name, alternate names, how people are cited, how information is cited, where is information coming from, etc. I have two important things to note about this process. 
Firstly, it is somewhat time intensive and needs to be done manually, but is fairly straightforward to do. So we can export our spreadsheet into Wiki. Instead, every in entry from our spreadsheet has to manually be added to Wiki. And secondly, for a user, the Wiki page isn't particularly visually appealing or clear or easy to navigate. So for this reason, the next step and future step of developing our knowledge base is to create what our IT support team at UBC call a presentation layer, which is the user interface or the web page where people can actually search and browse all our dictionary entries. So the place online where people will actually go to use the knowledge base. So what are our future steps forward in expanding our knowledge base? Right now, our dedicated team of undergraduate assistants are working to create entries in our relational lexicography wiki, and we are working to get the infrastructure in place to start to build the searchable and browsable presentation layer of the knowledge base on our project website. We will pilot the first version of our knowledge base as soon as we can. We want to highlight that this is a multi-year ongoing project that is responsive to user feedback and recommendations. So as we go, we will be making changes and tweaking as we learn more and hear more from people. We will develop a feedback form for people to share dictionaries with us that they would like added to the knowledge base um, or to clarify dic dictionary details um, of examples we already have on the knowledge base or for them to let us know if there are any dictionary entries that we should remove from the knowledge base and we will do that. Continuing on uh, future steps, uh, as we continue to expand this knowledge base, we hope this project helps us uh, all build lasting relationships and collaborate with other people working in uh, to develop dictionaries. As you mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, this knowledge base is part of a wider a relational lexicography project based at UBC. If you're interested in learning more about our projects, please check out the ICLDC presentation by our fellow team members titled Surveying Community-Based Language Creators to Develop a Relational Lexicography Toolkit and Framework. So we want to thank you all for joining us today in closing. And we also want to acknowledge that Meryl, Ben, and I are only three members of an ever-expanding team of collaborators, dictionary workers, and enthusiasts. And you can find out, you can find all of our community partners and collaborators on our project website, which is listed here on this slide. It's dictionaries.arts.ubc.ca. We are still looking for more dictionaries. As thorough as we try to be, we know that we have missed many. If you have forthcoming dictionaries you would like included, let us know. Have any apps you want us to check out? Let us know. Are there community published or printed dictionaries that might not have shown up in a search? Let us know. Really, send us any dictionary related resources. Even if we already have it written down, you might give us some more information that we can add to the entry for the dictionary. Similarly, if there are dictionary resources you don't want included for whatever reason, let us know that too. Thank you very much. I think that's a wrap.